stepped up, yelled, whatever you need to do. You did it good last week. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll remember to pray at the end of the service tonight. We'll take your request. And that'll give somebody some time to pick up the sheet back there in the back after it's all completed. All right? Open your Bible to get to chapter 4. I was wrong Sunday. I thought you were going into chapter 5. I didn't finish chapter 4 yet. Got close, but not completely. And uh, so we're going to we're gonna reverse back just a little bit. And I think there's enough tonight. And then we'll just go to prayer uh, wherever we stop in this particular chapter. But we do want to touch on a couple things we didn't share last week. And uh, so chapter 4 of the book of Esther. Esther chapter 4. And uh, just by way of review, going over what we've learned already in this one chapter... We've learned that this is a chapter we titled it E-Day, Esther Day. It is her day. It's her time to shine. And uh, her name means star, so she's going to shine. By chapter 5, she's definitely shining. But uh, as we look at this chapter, we look at several thoughts. And then his first, first four verses, you look at a lamentation being made. That lamentation being made is none other than Mordecai. He's heard already about the assault against the Jews. Uh, they're planning to exterminate every Jew. And how many of them did I tell you there were? They guess, or a historian tells us, that there probably was in all the 22 provinces of the, the, of the Medes and the Persians. I'll get it out in a minute. Uh, and by the way, it was 120-some provinces. How many did I tell you? Anybody remember? How many? 15 million. Uh, two, almost two and a half times what Hitler ever would have uh, assassinated and killed and murdered and gas and so forth. So it was quite quite a sad fare. And so uh, Mordecai hears about uh, a Hazarus signing the decree to have all of this done against his people. And he begins to, to lament. He begins to cry. He begins to grieve. He begins to weep. So the first nine verses he shares that. He expresses his grief by going out by the king's gate dressed in what? Sackcloth. Sackcloth and ashes. And literally he's praying. He's grieving even though the Bible doesn't say he's praying. But he was fasting, and the Bible has fasting in this particular uh, book of the Bible, yet you never find fasting in the Bible without what? Prayer. So even though prayer is never mentioned, God's name is never mentioned at all, we know that these people were certainly praying despite the fact God's name was never mentioned throughout the book. So we see the lamentation. He expresses it grievely and with great grief. Then there's the explanation of the, the grief. Uh, by that I simply mean in uh, the latter verses, beginning uh, about uh, verse 5, going down to verse 9, we are introduced to a new character that comes on the scene, Hitachi. And that is the spokesperson that becomes the palace's spokesperson for the Queen Esther, sending back and forth to Mordecai. She doesn't go to him, but she sends messages. And up to this point, the Queen has no inkling or idea that a Hazarus, her husband, has signed a decree to kill her people, some 15 million of them. And uh, so now she is being given the information that only Mordecai, Haman, and Ahasuerus had because she had not been with the king for 30 days. Remember that? And so that's why probably she didn't know about what all was going on at the palace as well as with the, the people. So first you see the lamentation, verse 9 verses. Then the, the verse 10 to verse 14, we talked about the communication. There's a communication going on constantly between Esther and Mordecai and uh, through that servant that we just mentioned a moment ago. And in the communication that goes on, she sends a first message out to her uncle and says, listen, I want you to know, Mordecai, uh, I've heard what's happening, but I need to ask you a question. And basically the question she's asking is, is it what do you want me to do? And basically what you're asking of me, because he's heard from him, you're asking me to go to a king that's got a law that says I can't go to him. If I go before the king without being uh, uh, given a, uh, an invitation, I'm going to die. I mean, it could mean my death. And so she says, hey, I am in a very sensitive, delicate position. And yet, I'm willing to do whatever you think I ought to do, but I'm in a very sensitive situation. It was a stickler for him, her, to be able to even consider doing so. And yet... We find the communication going back and forth in these verses. And then Mordecai sends back after hearing her plea about the situation and how sticky of a situation she is in a delicate position, she is reminded that, wait a minute, you are the queen. Have you not thought that because God helped you to win the contest, did you not think because you're in the position of queen that maybe God has you there? 
for just this particular time? And then she gets the message and she understands the message because she says the same thing. Well, maybe the hour is that I've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And she realizes that she has been given some favors of the Lord. She realizes that God has put her in a strategic location and place. Now, many people would probably think, well, what can one person do? What is one woman going to do when 15 million lives are in jeopardy? Well, one person can accomplish a lot. Yeah. Amen? I read a poem to you last week. I'm going to read it again called Only One. Okay? One can change things. One can make a difference. Hey, if you don't make a difference in a nation, you might be able to make a difference in a community. If you can't make a difference in a community, you might be able to make a difference in a subdivision. If you can't make a difference in a subdivision, you might be able to make a, a difference in a church. If you can't make a difference in a church, you might be able to make a difference in a family. And I mean all your family. We all have a sphere of influence. You have an influence I do not possess. I have an influence you do not possess. You can influence people I may never hear of, know about, or ever meet. And what we need to realize, just as Esther needed to use her influence for good, for God, and certainly for her people, we need to realize we have a place God's given every one of us. And that place is important, just as important as Esther, because you will influence some people one way or the other. Amen? And so we need to realize that. So uh, when you think about Esther in her situation, in her uh, dilemma, Mordecai sends back and says, hey, you're in a divine position. You're queen, and one person can make basically a difference. Are you aware one person has made a difference in even America? In 1776, one vote literally gave the America that we enjoy and live in the English language rather than German. Wow. Just by one vote. Because it was so many Germans occupying the country. Are you with me? One vote made the difference. One vote in 1876, 100 years later, literally put in the office I president, Rutherford Hayes, only won by one popular vote. And soon thereafter, we know the Electoral College years later started changing. I wish they'd give back to the popular vote myself. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're under the Electrical College. But... Electoral College, but uh, one vote made the difference. In 1923, one vote in Germany made all the difference in the world's history for, for decades to come and hundreds of years to come. Because in that one vote in Germany that was made, literally surrendered the German army to a man, a young man by the name of Adolf Hitler. And he ended up using his military power to seize the power. Are you with me? Yes. And so I'm just simply saying one vote can make a difference. One person can make a difference. And certainly thank God for Esther because she's in a position where she can have influence, use it, and use her influence toward the king. But in so doing, she realizes that it could cost a difficult price. In verse 16, she says, I'm going to go before the king. And if I go before the king, I want you to be fasting and praying three days, three nights before I go. And then when I go to see the king, if he doesn't hold out his hand of acceptance to me, of invitation to me, or the scepter to me, if I go, if I do what you ask me to do, I'm willing to do it. But if I perish, I'll just perish. And that sort of sounds dormant, doesn't it? It sort of sounds a gloom and doom kind of a, a statement for her to make. But I don't see it that way. I see it in a different light. I'm going to tell you about that in just a moment. So here a queen comes into the present. She's willing to lay down her life. She's willing to pay the price. And she's willing to give all. Jeremiah says it this way over in the book of Jeremiah. God told Jeremiah to run out into the streets of Jerusalem. Seek and find if you can any man to execute judgment and seek truth. What he's simply saying is God said, hey, I need to find a man. Even in the day of Ezekiel, Ezekiel gave the prophet Ezekiel was given a word from God and said, hey, I sought for a what? didn't say a bunch of men. He said one man. Just one man. Another passage of Scripture when Isaiah said, we were looking for one individual who would get a hold of God and pray. Sometimes God doesn't have much to work with. Are you aware of that? And so when he doesn't have much, we need to become that one man, that one woman that yields and surrenders and says, God, use me. Let me be your mouthpiece. Let me be your feet. Let me be your hands. Let me become your eyes. And that's exactly what Esther is needing to learn in these verses. 
During World War II, Winston Churchill, in 1940, made, I think, one of his greatest speeches. And in that speech, it contained this statement. Let us brace ourselves that if the British Empire and its commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will say, it is our day and our time to finish this hour. What he's simply saying is, he's saying, hey, we're willing to stand. We're willing to pay the price. We're willing to do whatever it takes to see that we remain free no matter what the price. And that's exactly what Esther's having to do. Can you imagine? Suppose if you knew that there was no invitation to come to the king. You know what the husband's like. We taught you that last week. Hot-headed, hot-headed, very temperamental, uh, very, very much a brutal kind of an individual. I mean, he'd just have, snap his finger and have people killed. He was the kind of king that said, hey, I don't want anybody to come in front of me, near me, sad, disappointed, with certain even bad news. I don't want to hear only good things. And that's the kind of king you're looking at. And yet she's going to come to him and basically offer a complaint to her husband, sort of nag, if you want to call it that. And man, there's no telling what this king could do to her. Just because she won the beauty contest, just because he fell in love with her, does not uh, necessitate, after these four years have passed, that he is going to hold out the scepter to her and say, hey, you can come, ask me what you will, I give you an open invitation. She was willing to pay the price. Why? Because she was willing to take a stand. Can I tell you what? This nation desperately needs some people still stand. Amen? I think it's sort of sad we don't have much voice at all. It doesn't seem like, it seems like everybody's quiet. We were talking to Marty at dinner this past uh, Sunday. And uh, I asked him, I said, how in the world did Princeton change so abruptly and so suddenly? When I left, granted, granted, it's been 20 years ago, 20-something years ago I left. But when I left, there wasn't, man, the, the liquor stores weren't like they are now. They're everywhere. You know, you just drive, they got the drive through and everything, so they come up town since then. But then the, the girly X-rated movie houses and girly clubs are all over Princeton and Bluefield. And when I say that, man, we just take a, a couple rides, aren't on, on they, baby? And it's sort of disgusting. How do they come in? How do they get in? Same way that Stanton and Waynesburg. I don't know if they posted that they were having a meeting. I don't know if they said anything about the gay clubs opening in the cities. But I'll tell you what. If they had a, surely some of us, surely somebody, for the, in, in, if nothing else but for morality's sake, forget the Bible, just for morality's sake. By the way, there is no morality without the Bible. That's right. Think about it. And so, man, just for morality's sake, or for God's sake, some churches, some people, we have got better, better organized. But man, it passed six to zero. All carried. And according to the article you brought me, no opposition whatsoever. How can we get to that point? Now, maybe they snuck it under the coat. I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know who's in supervisory capacity in those towns. But I'll tell you what, there should have been a voice vocalized, even if it was just one voice. Yeah. Amen. Even if it was little old Connections Baptist Church voice. Yeah. I didn't know a thing about it. But I'm just simply saying, hey, we kept liquor out of Decatur for the whole time I was there until the year I left. And because somebody changed the law, and his name was Governor George, I mean, Governor George Wallace, uh -huh. he was the reason Decatur became a liquor-saturated, beer-saturated city. There was no liquor, no bars, no saloons, no nothing in Decatur. But we and the other churches together, those who would stand, oh, yeah. fought against it, and we kept it out, literally. But what George did, he signed a different document that overruled the document that we were on at that particular time that said, hey, the, 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 the city itself gets the vote. George has overruled everything. And that's when I had a falling out with George Wallace. And I thought he was a sorry go. All right? I'm just simply saying, how does it get in? Because we don't sometimes stand like we ought to. Don't you think we ought to still stand? I know it may never be reversed. I know it may never be changed. But man, when over one million Babies, innocent lives are slaughtered annually. Man, don't you think it's time that we say something? Amen. I read an article the other week. Isn't it amazing that if a mother that is pregnant gets killed or murdered, that person who murdered her has to serve two sentences, both for the wife yeah. 
or the woman and the baby. And yet, isn't it interesting? The abortion said there's no life there. They say it's just nothing, just a mass. And yet there are people in prison serving two, two life sentences because of murdering a pregnant woman. Are you with me? So that ought to tell us volumes right there. Would you not agree with that? And yet we have to stand. We have to vote accordingly. One way that we have power, uh, we ought to stand and we ought to vocalize when we can. But man, this woman's having to take a stand for God. Man, for the abortion, for the porn problems. Man, like I said a moment ago, for the gay club that is being um, open both in Waynesburg and Stanton. Just amazes me. And yet, probably because nobody stands. Well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to major on that tonight, but it, she was willing to pay a very, very difficult, difficult price. And uh, she's willing to perish. I want, to, I want to ask you some questions. What is providence? When we talk about the providence of God, what do we really mean? Somebody give me a definition. I know we don't usually talk out some on Wednesday night, or excuse me, Tuesday night. Uh, somebody give me what the providence of God means to you. What, what is it, what's a good definition of the providence of God? I want to make sure we're all on the same page. What is it? Well, yes, but no. <laughs> somebody give me a definition of the promise of God. Basically, it is God working behind the scenes, controlling all the affairs of men. All right, that's about the simplest I can get it, okay? Yeah, it's much deeper than that, trust me. But when you read your Bible, you can see his hand all through it. You can see it when men who even wondered if God was going to come to their aid at times was even there, and even if there was a God. Are you with me? And yet, certainly, when you look at the Revolutionary War, you look at our tag forces, I mean, they were, I mean, they didn't know, a lot of those guys were farmers. They never even had a gun in their hand. Are you with me? And yet we won the thing. We were outnumbered. We were outtrained. We were outgunned. And they had military cannons that they were out. There were more cannons they delivered here. We didn't hardly have any ships. And man, I mean, we were outnumbered in every way. And yet we won. Can I tell you why? Problems of God. God had a purpose for America. God had a reason for the founding of this nation. Now, we know the original forefathers said they found it so that they could have freedom uh, of religion. Today's cry is, I want freedom from religion. Amen? Right. Sad to say. But uh, the truth is, man, it was freedom for to worship as you see fit in whatever church. They were tired of the Church of England. Dead, dying, decaying, Ichabod wrote on it. They left because they were being forced to tie to the Church of England and to give to the Church of England and to be a member of the Church of England and to attend the Church of England. And they said, no more. We will not dare do that. And so thank God they came. They paid prices. Those men and women who got on board the different three, three vessels that landed at least over in Jamestown, I mean, they, they, they survived, some of them, but man, with a lot of hardship, a lot of hardship. They were willing to pay the price. But man, can you not see the hand of God? I think the Indians were being led by God. Had it not been for the Indians, they wouldn't have survived. The Indians taught the early colonists how to eat in America. Once their supplies were gone, famished, done, they taught them about corn. Aren't you glad? Praise God. Nothing better than, than a good old ear of corn with butter. Amen and amen. Amen. In fact, let's just say amen right now. Let's go eat some. All right? But anyway, but I'll tell you what. I'm just simply saying the Indians came to their aid. It was a God thing. And you can see God's hand in so many nations. You can see God's hand in working behind so many lives. You can see God leading men even start churches in particularly parts of the country and around the globe. And certainly the missionary fervor that we talked about many times in our messages. What is promise of God? Let me give you some things I've learned about the providence of God. I want to give you four of them very quickly. Number one, God's promise simply means he always has a purpose. All right? We've preached for years. God's got a purpose for everything. Now, let me tell you, there are three groups as God sees them in the entire globe of the world. All right? This is the way God sees them. They're really narrowed down to two. We're going to get to that in a minute. But the three primary groups that God sees are, anybody know what they are? Give me one. He sees them as Jews. Give me another one that you ought to know after the Jews comes. Gentiles. Gentiles. And the third that he's dealing with primarily today is his church. All right? They're the three groups God sees. If there's still Jews in the world, that group still exists. They're still in blindness. They're in rejection of Jesus Christ. The Gentiles overwhelmingly, according to the way the, 
The Gentiles would be, according to God's viewpoint, all of them are unsaved. They're Gentiles. Now, we were Gentile, but we got saved, so now we make up the church, all right? So if you met Jesus Christ, you saved you. God made you a part of his church. Whether you're a member of a local church or not, you're a part of the church as long as you know Christ as your Lord and Savior. But God has so, sort of just focused a lot of his attention now on what? The church age. The church itself, the body of Christ. It's special to him. We're the reason he came to die. For those who would say, I'll be a comer, whosoever will. I'll trust him. I'll receive him. I'll believe on him. Are you with me? But then when you look at those three groups, basically there's just two groups. And I joke around by using two uh, rhyming words. They're saints and they're ain'ts. And that's really the two that God sees. Everybody on the globe, God says, you're a saint. That means you're a child of God. Or you ain't. And that's what God looks at. But can I tell you, for all of those groups, for every individual within those groups, God's got a wheel. God's got a plan. God's got a purpose. And especially in this room, for every person here tonight, God's got a plan and a purpose for your life. It may not be to be a preacher, but we ought to preach the gospel wherever we can get an opportunity. I get to witness for a guy, to, a, to a Yankee today. I always enjoy to witness to Yankees. Most, I don't know why I have a, I have a real mindset that is that most Yankees don't know the Lord. I don't know why I have that feeling, but anyway. But uh, New Bedford, Massachusetts, well, he and I started talking. He came to buy something of my mama's uh, for my, our shoe. And we got to talking on the front porch, and, and uh, I liked his shirt. He had the Boston Red Sox on, which, it, I mean, I just love them because they beat the Yankees a lot. But anyway, yeah. praise God for that. But but, uh, and, and I just said, hey, you from Massachusetts? He said, yeah, I'm from Massachusetts. I'm from New Bedford. I said, whoa. I know that. I've shared illustrations several times in my ministry from uh, a bar in New Bedford and uh, how there was a rape and all these bar people that was drinking and everything just let that girl be raped right before all their eyes and never offered any opposition, never spoke a single word, not any. And he said, yeah. And then he named the girl, which I wouldn't have known. And then also near the New Bedford area, he told me about another crime, and I knew her uh, that is in prison, in a lady's prison right now. But uh, so we, we talked a little while and broke the ice a little while. And then I asked him, I said, sir, I said, let me ask you a question. I said, do you know that if you die, you'd go to heaven? Man, he put a big old smile on his face. He really, I really didn't think many Yankees were saved. Then. I really did. <laughs> but, 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 but anyway, but he, but he put a big old grin on his face. He said, I sure did. I said, can you tell me how? And he said, I was back in New Bedford. He said, I was running with the wrong crowd. I was in a gang. He said, almost everybody in that gang is going to prison but me. He said, the only thing that kept me from going is that I, the, some of the decisions they made, I, I said, I don't want any part of that. I'm not going to go do that tonight. And, and many of them got caught and so forth. And then he just, oh, hello. he said, there was a brother named Dez that came. In fact, he came out of Lynchburg. I said, by any chance he come out of Lynchburg Baptist College or Liberty College? because uh, it used to be Glenchburg Baptist and then it changed to Liberty Baptist and it's Liberty University. He said, yes, many years ago, because this guy's probably only pushing 50 at least. And he said, he came to New Bedford, knocked at my door, and I was living in the project. I was poor, I was poor he was poor as Joe's turkey, according to this guy. And he said, man, Mendez invited me to his church. I came to hear him preach it, just starting a brand new church. And through one of those services, I came to know Christ as Savior. And man, me and him talk about the things of God becoming a Christ and Reformed Baptist and Reformed Presbyterian and all this kind of junk. And he's a big talker, so can you imagine? We fought for word between each other. Amen and amen. But I'm simply saying, it was a joy to meet another believer by witnessing and finding out that he was a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I tell you what, what's neat is, isn't it amazing how you can meet somebody and just something inside you goes off and say, hey, I believe, man, there is a vibe there. And I hugged him as a brother in Christ when he got in his car. And it was something I told him about connections. He was looking for a church to just join one just recently out where he lives. And that's out beyond uh, Marlboro Baptist. But anyway, made a long story short, it's great to know God's got a purpose for all of us. Regardless of what that purpose is, you just need to find his purpose and you need to do it and live it. Amen? Would you agree with that? Amen. Can, you, can you imagine how God's purpose and plan is fulfilled not in just the godly, but sometimes God has used many times the ungodly, has he not? He's going to use a hazardous, an ungodly king. He's not a Christian by no means. But he's going to be used to deliver God's people again from annihilation and extermination. He's an ungodly king, but God uses him. You find King Darius. Darius was used by God in many ways. When Nehemiah was going in to rebuild the walls, it was an ungodly king. Didn't know his God. 
but he knew something was real in Nehemiah's life and said, hey, listen, you can go. Take as long as you, you will, but I'm going to do something better. I'm going to give you everything you need to do, whatever you need to do there. And that's exactly, you remember the book of Nehemiah when we were in the early chapters and how that man, everything was right. Hey, what, what is behind all of that? What power is uh, moving the chess pieces in place in those situations? It's God. That's the province of God. So I've learned not only the promise of God includes God's purpose, but secondly, it always will include God's people. God will use people to do his will. We, we agree with that? In fact, I don't know any other thing that he can use anything. In fact, see, even Jesus said, hey, even Jesus said that, hey, even if the, um, oh, what was it? What was it going to cry out when he was being crucified? Oh, man, somebody was going to cry out. He said, even, oh, if the stones were to even cry out, God could even make the stones to testify of me. But God rather used what? You and I. He chose to use sinners saved by the grace of God. We don't, we don't deserve to be used. We don't deserve to serve. Well, I'm glad God chose us. Amen. And I'm glad he chose to use humanity to, to win and reach other humans that need the gospel. Man, get in the way. Find a place where God can use you. Find that purpose God has for your life and just stay there. Amen? Just live in it. Abide in it. Enjoy it. Because it's great. When you think about God using people, I think of one person. One of my favorite books. It's just a four-chapter book, but it's a great book. The book of Jonah. Man, when you think about Jonah, God's using a man, right? But do you realize that man don't want to be used? Man, he does anything. When God came, he said, and the Bible says he came, by the way, it says he came again and again, and a second time, and so forth. And finally, finally, after putting him through uh, the, I guess we'll call it God's woodshed, he was willing to say yes. But you know the story. God said, I want you to go preach to the Nevada. There's a lot of history about whether or not there was, his, his mother and father may have been murdered by the Nevada. They were very godless people. They were, they were terrible at cruelty. They loved to torment and torture their victims when they captured them. Yeah. And that was probably one of the things that even Jonah could have known. And can't, he may be thinking in his brain, how in the world, Lord, could you save anybody like that? But when you read the account in just chapter 1, look at what God does. Jonah goes, the Bible says, starts going. He says, I want you to go down to, to Nineveh. Well, excuse me, I want you to go up to Nineveh because we're actually north. And the minute you look at that, I'm sure he said, Lord, not me. I'm not going. And that's basically what he did. And the next verse says, and he went down to Joppa, and he paid the fare. And he went down, and in, in, in about two or three scriptures, it'll say over and over again, and he went down, and he went down, and he went down. Can I tell you what? It don't take far to get down. All just all it takes is one step away from God. Just read the book today, by the way, John. And when you, when you think about it, look at what he does. Number one, he paid the fare to a clerk. Or maybe someone on board the boat. God was using that man because that man found a seat where Jonah could find to board that vessel. Are you with me? So he used that man. That man did not know God. Then it's after he gets aboard the ship, it's not long that man, he opens his mouth. He, you could tell he was a little bit like Bill Johnson. He just had to rattle his mouth. He had to rattle his tongue. And he was like the guy I'm today. He said, I'm going to tell you, preacher, I can stay here for an hour. We can just talk about the things of God and so forth and so on. I said, well, I don't have an hour, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not willing to give you an hour. But, man, it's been great to meet you and so forth and so on. Hey, there's people who like to talk. Right? You know? Now, I know we tease ladies about talking, but some of us can be just as bad. Mark, I talked to you over an hour on the telephone, maybe even two hours before. Okay? He's got a lot of feminine genes in him. But anyway, <laughs> but I'm only kidding. But man, Marty can talk. Man, he doesn't talk a lot on the telephone. At least he not, never has with me. But you get him at a restaurant, he'll talk your ears off. And uh, I'm just saying that, hey, we men talk a lot. Use a lot of words too, all right? Yeah. But man, evidently, the talking preacher opened his big mouth, all right? What did he say? He told those sailors who he was, and he told those sailors what God wanted in his life. Because there's one little verse... One phrase in one verse said he had aforetime told them that God had called him and that he was running from God, basically. All right, I'm paraphrasing the, the statement. So, hey, now there's a bunch of sailors on board, captain on board, 
And uh, how is God going to use anything else? Well, he's going to use something else. He's going to use the next one. The captain's going to approach in. A storm arises. And man, they try to fight against the wind. They try to fight against the storm. And man, it gets worse and worse and worse. And the captain finally, well, the sailors told him, the mates told him, the, the captain comes and says, hey, listen, we understand you're on board. You're not one of us. We want to know something about you. He was one that did not evidently know all the details yet. And all of a sudden, Jonah confesses, hey, I'm on board. This is all probably, maybe, because of me. But hey, listen, the captain didn't listen then. The captain went back to his control panel, to the ship uh, workers on board, and said, hey, listen, we're going to fight this thing. And they tried fighting it for a while. But they saw they weren't going anywhere. And that if anything was going to happen, they were about doomed and going to go down. Now God's going to use multi-men. All of a sudden, all these different crewmen come down. Hey, doing this whole storm, guess what? A backslidden preacher doing nothing but sleep. That's how sorry he was. Man, they're about to die. And the backslidden preacher's down at the bottom of the ship sleeping. And so they come by, and man, the crewmen come down, they wake him up and says, Listen, is all of this, what is your occupation again? He basically says, I'm a prophet, okay? Where'd you come from? Who's your family? And what is your mission, basically? Now I'm paraphrasing it all, but I'm telling you what the book tells you. And man, he finally confesses it. And uh, so they just simply say, if we throw you overboard, is this going to all stop? Is this all going to cease? I don't think Jonah really knew the answer, but I think he did. And so they do it. So hey, we, we, just think of how God's using all these men. A captain, a ticket taker, to give them fare on board. But now God's going to use something other than just a man. He's going to use a fish. And man, can you imagine? They throw him overboard, and the Bible says immediately God prepared a big fish, or a great fish is what the Scripture says. I know we call it a whale. Jonah and the what? Whale. And it may have been a whale. It could have been bigger than a whale. It could have been a special devised, created fish just for Jonah. Doesn't have to mean it's a whale. I understand but regardless of what it was, it was big enough to occupy a backslidden preacher. Can you imagine a picture of him in his belly, the acids of that fish? Mm. In fact, when he gets spit up, the acid had completely made him completely white. The Bible says he was white. It almost looked like he had leprosy. All right? But man, he was white as a sheep. And man, I imagine, don't you imagine, somebody said, how long have you been in that fish? He said, man, three days, three nights. Man, I bet you're hungry. Yeah. He said, well, listen, we got some fish for you to eat. Would you like some fish? <laughs> I don't think he ever had an appetite to go to Peter's Fish House anywhere else. I'm just simply saying, God was using the circumstances, one thing after another, to get the one vessel, the one people, the one person, to do the one purpose and plan for that individual's life. What does he have to do for sometimes us? Amen? So I'm just saying that, hey, his province works and uses people. His province includes a purpose. And let me quickly say, aren't you glad in his province, that his province, as you study, as you read it, as you observe it, God is always patient in his province. Hey, Jonah is a perfect exception. I mean, perfect example. He was patient with Jonah. He said, I want you to do this. I'm going to make you do what, whether, whether you want to go or not. You will want to by the time I'm done. Why? Because he was patient with him. Yeah, I mean, he, he told him no. He went the complete opposite, but God moved to arrange the circumstances to where he'd repent and get right with God. And eventually, an entire nation came to God, came to Christ, came and got revived according to history as well as according to the book of Jonah. Quite a revival. Are you with me? With an old, dead, stale, conforming, compromising, dead preacher but he had to get resurrected himself, and God gave him that. God does that over and over again. He shows us patience. Man, didn't God have patience with many of you? How many of you here tonight got saved the first time you knew you learned you were a sinner, Christ died, the very first time you were presented the gospel? You didn't know it until we showed up that night? Really? Good night. That's, that's interesting, all right? Only one? Man, Herbert Langford lived at my machine shop box with gospel track. Every day he had a new track. And I'm not exaggerating. I don't know how many months that went on. And I kept reading and kept reading and kept reading. Man, the Jack Van Ippie had a bunch of tracks back then. It's full of sermons. And 
He brought me the coming roar with Russia that he's preaching across the country back then, all Bible prophecy. He brought me several Olive Greens on Bible prophecy. The, the chick tracks that you used to love and give out, and you probably still have some and use them, which is a cartoon type of gospel, which, man, I was, I was infatuated with them. And, man, he'd bring me one of them every, every day, just constantly feeding it to me. Well, what was God doing? In his providence, was using those little tracts, those little pieces of paper, those little booklets, sowing seed in the word of God inside me, watering it to when that last track by Olive B. Green was read, my heart met the master. And, man, my spirit, my heart was broken, and I knew that I knew I had to do something about Jesus Christ. He was confronting me. Oh, are you going to trust me? Will you receive me? Will you believe on me? And thank God that night I did. All right? But it didn't. Man, he was so patient with me. And I've seen him do the same with many others that I've led to Christ. Maybe some now go by. Man, back, back years ago when we were in West Virginia, Sergeant Wright, and I told his story. Big old dude. Uh, he was a, a, a staff sergeant in the Marine Corps. And, uh, man, little old uh, Nettie. I still remember her first name. Nettie would come down to the altar many a Sunday morning and cry and weep and pray. Sometimes she'd ask me to come pray with her, and we were praying for Sarge to get saved. Man, I couldn't tell you how many visits I made to Sarge out. Can I tell you how bad he was? If he peeked out, he always used the answer the door, but he would pull up the little thing, lift in the trailer park. He'd pull up the little little piece of cloth over top of that little hole there on the wall, so to speak, in the door, and if he saw my face, he'd put it back down, and he'd run to the bedroom. <laughs> And Eddie would come and answer. Eddie would come and answer the door, literally. And uh, I'd sit there. And so we, we did that a couple times, and he kept just evading me. So I met her one Sunday at church. I said, I figured this thing out. This is how we're going to do this. I'm going to keep coming by your house, but when you're sitting there with me, I'm going to give you the gospel. That rascal's going to hear something back in that bedroom as I preach the gospel to you. And I'm telling you the honest gospel truth. That's exactly what I did several times. Man, he was back there. He couldn't. He could hear every word we said. No TV was back. The TV was, I had the TV control. Okay? And man, he heard it, he heard it, heard it. And as God's my witness, my wife can testify. I was coming to eat one night. It wasn't even a visitation night. And I came to eat. About the time I got to the table, I saw his face flash across my, my mind. Now again, promises of God. God leading, God moving behind the scene because he was in control. And he knows what we don't know. And she, she had just set the table, and I said, honey, I can't eat right now. She said, what you going to? I said, I'm, I'm going to dress. I'm going to go over to see Sarge tonight. I just have a compulsion inside me that says I need to go see him. And that night, he came to the door, picked up, opened the blessed door, and gave me a hug, Paul, when I showed up. He said, how did you know, preacher, I wanted to see you? Yeah, amen. I'm telling you the honest truth. That guy got saved that night. But do you know, he promised to be in church the next Sunday. This was on a, like a Tuesday night. We used to go visiting on, on Thursday night. And on Tuesday night, he got saved. And uh, he was going to be there Sunday morning, walk down the aisle and, and present himself for baptism. He didn't show up. And man, the devil did a double job on me. That sorry lying scandal. He didn't get saved, that booger. Man, he, he just lied to get rid of me. He hugged me and just, he just got tired of me bugging him. All right? And man, the devil showed up you all kinds of stuff. The truth of the matter is, he had an emergency later that week that sent him to the VA hospital in Beckley. And by Sunday night, the wife called and said, hey, uh, Sarge wanted me to tell you, he's so sorry he didn't honor God and didn't obey what you asked him to do for Christ today. He's up at Beckley. So I went up and saw, saw him. Can I tell you, in two days, Paul, he had a Bible in his hand and was reading it. Can I tell you, by the time he died 10 days later, he had started memorizing scripture. He had started, he had already witnessed to all the nurses in that hospital that came to his room. She said, I saw my husband tell the doctor, let me tell you what just happened to my, my heart and my life. And she boasted about Jesus coming into his heart and his life and saving him. Man, he was a whole different preacher. I didn't know that he had a millionaire son from Atlanta, Georgia. That's the most money anybody's ever given me to preach a funeral. I don't ask him at any, but he gave me an envelope. When I took it home, I was shocked what was in it. He said, I want to do it because I tried to get him to take it back. And, uh, man, I knew he had money when he showed it in the car he was driving. But, but man, he's a, he's a contractor in, in the city of Atlanta, Georgia. But, uh, man, I'm telling you, it, it's great to be in the purpose of God. It's great to be in the plan. Of God. It's great to be what God wants you to be because that is the most productive place of your life. Amen? Amen. 
Hey, if God's patient, amen. Let me give you the last one. I learned that there's there's a purpose with this province. With the province of God, God uses people. With the province of God, God uses patience. But with the province of God, I'm grateful to say, and I forget what he were, I used for this one, uh, preacher with his alliteration, right? Always prevails. Can I tell you what? Aren't you glad you're on the winning side? Mm-hmm. Aren't you glad you're on the winning team? I love to win. We played Uno uh, Attack, like we played with y'all the other night uh, at our house Friday night with Jeremy and Jill. And, and that rascal beat me. I mean, I won three pretty quick. And I thought, man, I'm going to take this tonight. And don't you know he beat me four? And my wife, she's a big loser that night. She won zero. She didn't get one game one. But uh, we had a ball, and I'm very competitive. Uh, and you, most of y'all know that. I was in school, was in sports, and I don't like messing up, and I don't like making mistakes. Now, I may punch a little bit, may even cheat a little bit if I have to to win, but don't say it yet. It's not cheating when you have that thing. It's on a timer. I, you know why they call me a cheater? I have a game I bring. In fact, I brought it to y'all seniors thing, which we didn't have, and I'll do that next time we meet. But it's called catchphrase, and you, and you got to hit this thing. Anybody know what catchphrase is? It's a little round device, and it pops up words, and you got to get them to guess the word that just popped up without using any form, uh, and there's certain rules to it, and it's got a buzzer, and that thing's going inside, going beep, 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 and every buzzer time's different. It's not all a minute. It's not always 30. You don't know when it's going to go off. The reason these people at church call me a cheater is because several times when we were at a couple's retreat, I'd hold that thing. I already knew I could give a clue that would get it guessed, except for some moron that was just stupid. But anyway, but uh, but uh, I'd hold that thing and beep, beep, beep. Now, I also got caught with it some, because it beat and then it goes, then you lose. Everybody with me? So anyway, but I'm very competitive, but I'm glad, thank God, I don't have to be with God, because God will make you a winner every time. Amen. Praise God. Hey, let me give you an example of the promise of God. Bill gave me this testimony last week after, yeah, last Monday or Tuesday we were talking. And uh, just before his wife had emergency surgery on Saturday, he rushed her in at 3 a.m. Saturday morning. Now, little did she know, she didn't know what was going to happen, but God did. And God pre-prescribed some things that was already taken care of before she ever had to go to the hospital. Well, poor brother Bill's stupid. He ain't got the brains that... Maxine's got to shop for groceries. She had already bought all the groceries for the week, which she doesn't usually do until the weekend. But she already had it, already taken care of. And then he told me, the latter one, he said, man, you ain't believe this preacher, a week or two before this happened, we just got to talk and said, you know what, man, I want to, maybe we ought to get one of those chairs that just completely throws you out, almost throws you on your face on the floor. You know what I'm talking about? You know, when you push a button and the thing raises you up, and if you, if you just sit, you will get in the floor. But it helps you lift you up. She, man, he, had, he said, I had no idea my wife would have that kind of surgery. And one of the toughest things for her to do at home this week is to kind of get up out of a chair. And so the, the easy chair made it easier for her. Isn't God good to do things like that? Do you not realize that? Amen. So we've looked at the, the, the two points, the lamentations in that chapter. We've looked at the conversation in the chapter. I want you to see the dedication in the chapter. The, the dedication is seen in Esther. And i got to hurry. In verse 16, if I perish, I perish. It's not a gloom doom. It is a consecrated dedication of a woman that says, I'm willing to pay all, give all, whatever it costs. Amen. I'm willing to do it. Amen. I'm willing to do it. And we ought to be willing as well. Amen? Man, how we need to be more dedicated, consecrated unto uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. David Livingston is one of my heroes. And I have several books on and he was an African pioneer missionary. But he walked over 29,000 miles. I looked up this today. 29,000 miles by foot in the jungles to give gospel, get the gospel to more and more tribes and more and more villages. That's a whole lot of walking. Almost 30,000 miles. That's a lot of walking. He did so, what I found interesting, half blinded. He only had half his sight. Third thing is he sacrificed his wife on the field. She died of a fever. So there was a sacrifice involved in this great man of God. But can I tell you, David Livingston, before he died, made this statement, and many have quoted it. Lord God, send me anywhere, but only promise to go with me. Lay any burden on me, only promise, though, you'll sustain me. 
Sever from me any tie or thing that binds me, but tie me to your service and to yourself. It's a pretty good statement of dedication. Wouldn't you agree? Can I tell you, boy, if we had that kind of consecration, if I had a little bit of that, I could probably shake the world for God. Man, how we need to be consecrated fully unto the Lord God. Amen? Romans 12, verse 1 says, I beseech thee, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your body a what? Living sacrifice. And how we need to do that every day of our lives so that we can fulfill God's purpose, God's will, God's plan for our life, just as he's about to fulfill in this young queen, Esther's life. And boy, we're going to see in chapter 5 quite a change. It's going to go very fast in chapter 5 as she takes her stand and she's willing to pay her price to serve God. Let's dismiss in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of Esther tonight. Thank you so much for the things and the lessons we are learning. And Father, how we are enjoying studying it, looking at words, looking at the verses. And Father, I just pray that you'll continue to bless the remaining portions of it. I think six more chapters to our heart as we look in this book. And Father, may the Holy Spirit become our teacher. May you open up our minds, our hearts to receive the seed of the engrafted word of God each Tuesday night. And help us to then take after we heed, after we hear, may we put it in the shoe leather, is our prayer. Help us to be consecrated. Help us to be sold out. Help us to be dedicated to you, to your purpose, 